Hello, my name is Marcus Krieger. I work for the Historical and Cultural Society of Clay County in Moorhead, Minnesota. Uh, and uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, local nurses uh, and their service in the First World War. Uh, and uh, I imagine maybe some of you don't are not familiar with Clay County, Minnesota. Uh, so I'll just tell you a little bit about where we are. We're in northwestern Minnesota on the Red River. We're on the border between uh, uh, Minnesota and North Dakota. In fact, I'm in Moorhead, Minnesota right now, and the very next building to my west is in Fargo, North Dakota. So uh, Moorhead, Minnesota is the, is the largest uh, city in Clay County, uh, part of the Fargo-Moorhead metro area, which has about, today it's got about a quarter million people in it, which some, com some people, if you're living somewhere else, you might not think that that's a very big town, but we're about as big as a as big as metro areas get on the Great Plains. So we're we're actually right at the edge of the Great Plains uh, and uh, right where the the, the Great F North Woods start um, and uh, in the in the Red River Valley. So we're a farm a lot of farms around here. Uh, other towns uh, in Clay County are the, the, the smaller than Moorhead include Georgetown and Glendon and, and Barnesville and Dilworth and Holly and Eulen, Hitterdahl, Rolog, Sabin. Uh, there's other around here, uh, rich agricultural community, but a lot of good land around here. Um, so yes, back to our topic at hand. I'm gonna we're gonna meet a lot of people today in this presentation, but uh, we are going to focus on these four women: uh, Signe Lee, who was a nurse in the Army Nurse Corps. Uh, she served stateside in army bases. Uh, we are going to talk about Rose Clark, who was a Red Cross nurse who was in uh, uh, frontline uh, hospitals in France, uh, battlefield hospitals. Uh, Hilma Freeberg was a nurse in the Army Nurse Corps who was serving in base hospitals in France. And Elizabeth McGregor, who would work worked for what we now call an NGO, a non-governmental organization or a charity, called the American Fund for French Wounded, and she worked in, uh, uh, she helped uh, uh, mostly civilians, women and children mostly, who were living uh, close to the front lines in France. So we'll start off with Signe Lee. Signe Lee is somebody who I. Um, have been obsessed with for a dozen years or so ever since I moved into her house. Uh, uh, I live in Signe Lee's house in Moorhead. Uh, but Signe, she grew up in Moor, uh, uh, on a farm out about maybe seven miles from where I'm sitting here, uh, north of Glendon on the Buffalo River. Um, the Red River Valley has a whole lot of Norwegian immigrants in it at this time, and the first major group of Norwegian uh, uh, pioneer settlers of the Red River Valley were Signe's grandparents. Uh, and so they, they led some people out here in 1870. So that's one thing that we should be uh, uh, have in mind for this presentation here is that when World War I is starting, uh, the, we're talk, the, the people dealing with it were like the children and grandchildren of the early pioneers. Some of those old sod busters of, of Minnesota are still around at this time. Um, it was only, yeah, Moorhead, our towns aren't 50 years old yet, aren't quite. So when the war starts, Signe is uh, 33 years old. Uh, she is a nurse at the Cass County Hospital in Fargo, and she uh, volunteers to uh, for the Army Nurse Corps. And what, what you know, like I said, I'm kind of obsessed with Signe Lee. Uh, she's one of my little history friends that I follow, uh, and uh, so I was just over the moon when I found out that Signe Lee uh, kept a scrapbook of her time as an army nurse during World War I, and she donated it to the Minnesota Historical Society. So we are going to, so the, the next few images that we're looking at here come from her scrapbook. So. <clears throat> So she here is a photograph of the mess hall at Camp MacArthur, which is near uh, Waco, Texas, I believe. Uh, so this is this is where they would the, the nurses ate. And 
this was not a cushy job. She was serving stateside, but this was not a cushy job because throughout human history, army camps have always been among the deadliest places you can be. And the reason is you got a, a bunch, you got a whole bunch of guys from all over the country, all cramped together, and they're all bringing their own diseases from home. So, and the the colds in Carolina are different than the colds in California, and Minnesotans don't have antibodies to either of them. So, and you got like thousands of guys all piled up on top of each other, and they're all a bunch of messy boys without their moms around. So, uh, they and people get sick. Uh, and the and during the Civil War, twice as many soldiers died of disease than died in combat. And that's another thing that we should uh, that I want to point out is what to people who lived who uh, in World War One, the Civil War was only 50 years before. The Civil War was as close in time to people in world in 1918 as the Vietnam War is to us right now, at the time I'm recording this. Uh, and there were huge advances of in in uh, medical uh, in the medical world o over that 50 years between 1865 World War One ends and 1917 America enters uh, uh, World War One. I'm sorry, 1865 is when the Civil War ends, and uh, and uh, 1917 is when America enters the the First World War. Uh, things like we, we much better knowledge of viruses and bacteria. Um, uh, doctors started to, during the Civil War, do this thing where they washed their hands and sterilized instruments sometimes. <laughs> um, that was routine by World War One. During World War One, we even had mobile x-ray machines on the front line so you can see if, there, if a guy's got shrapnel in him that you gotta, uh, you gotta take out. So, it, 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 and, but I think probably the most crucial development uh, between the two wars is that between those two wars, nursing became a paid profession done by people with scientific training. So as in like there were women nurses during the Civil War, but um, it was there wasn't a lot of training or a lot of scientific knowledge. Nursing was just something that women did. Um, but by the time but 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 in the in the opening decades of of the 1900s, um, nursing became professionalized, and uh, during World War One, America sent ten thousand nurses overseas. And so, we had every reason to believe when those ten thousand nurses went overseas, we had every reason to believe that this was it was going to be different this time. Like I said, twice as many soldiers died of disease than died of than died in combat during the Civil War. This time. Everybody knew it was going to be different. And then the influenza pandemic hit. Uh, we, Amer the world kind of forgot about this, how bad the influenza pandemic was until, uh, uh, until COVID happened. And now, and then we all started talking about it again. It was really in the news a few years ago. Um, but yeah, it, it was, it was bad about one in four people. Uh, supposedly got the flu in 1918, 1919, 1920. And, and of those people who got it, about 3% of the people died of it. Uh, and this was a weird disease in the sense that it didn't just kill the old and the weak. It was the opposite. This, this disease used your own immune system against you. So the younger you were, the healthier you were, the stronger you were, the deadlier this was. Uh, so it, it killed the young, like, um, well, like young men in the armies of, of World War I. In fact, well, that's where we think that it's probably started was in was in an, uh, the Spanish influenza is what we called it, but it's probably started at Camp Funston, at a U.S. Army camp in uh, Kansas. Uh, and it at first, like I said, all those colds and and uh, bugs and viruses are all uh, from all around the country are all uh, mingling in these soldiers' bodies, coming and mutating and coming out uh, deadlier and more. Uh, uh, more, you know, spreading faster. So uh, when it was started at Camp Funston, uh, it was not particularly like deadly 
it, but it was very contagious. And then we took it to Europe and our, our soldiers took it to Europe and then it, it, in the trenches of uh, it, it mixed with French <laughs> de, uh, bodies and immune systems and diseases and uh, British and German and Canadian and Moroccan and Algerian and, and Indian. And uh, it became incredibly deadly uh, over there. So why do we call it Spanish influenza? Well, because interestingly, Spain was one of the few countries that did not was not at war. It was one of the few neutral countries in this war. And because of that, they didn't they weren't censoring their newspapers. So uh, it, this was hitting Engl the English soldiers and French soldiers and uh, really hard. But and uh, uh, young soldiers were dying like crazy, but they didn't want to they, they didn't put that in the newspapers because they didn't want the Germans to know. And the Germans were, were dying like crazy, but they didn't want the English and the and the French to know. So but the, the, the one country where the news is getting out about how bad this really is, is Spain. And we're re uh, we Americans are reading in Spanish newspapers about this terrible disease. And so we figure it comes from Spain, but actually it came from us, uh, is, is the latest thinking. So here's a, uh, and so Signe recorded all this, this historic time in, in her, uh, scrapbook. Uh, these, there's a photograph of her in, uh, and first, up patients ward 27 following the flu um, and, and across the street from ward 27 where Signe worked they built a bandstand so apparently you know presumably to entertain the uh, soldiers who were being sick at the time. In 1936 Signe Lee uh, did a uh, interview with a Fargo Forum newspaper and uh, the forum wrote, when the flu epidemic broke out in the fall of 1918, the hospital at Fort Sam Houston, where she was at that time, received a large convoy of influenza patients from Camp Sherman, Illinois. Because of the dread of the disease, the train was not allowed to stop en route. They had no food nor water. Some of the men died on the way. The convoy arrived at night and the day nurses were called back on duty. It took 48 hours of unceasing work to place the care uh, to place and care for the sick. So that is a recipe for how to spread a pandemic right there. Put everybody on one of these train cars and don't let them get out. Here's a photograph, Corman and, uh, a student nurse who worked on Ward 27 during the flu. So a corpsman is a uh, soldier who works in some kind of medical capacity, like a, like a nurse or something. Uh, if you are in the Navy or the Marine Corps, you, they're still called corpsmen, I believe. And but uh, uh, Army, we use, it's uh, we call them medics now. Uh, <clears throat> But it wasn't the influenza pa uh, pandemic that was the worst of it. Uh, according to that newspaper article in 1936, it, it was a outbreak of meningitis, sp uh, spinal meningitis throughout the camp that uh, was the worst of it. She, it said, but, the scourge, but of the scourges that swept through the camps, there was nothing so frightful as spinal meningitis. There were never enough nurses and they contracted the malady too. It was while run, uh, nursing on such a, an isolation ward that Miss Lee contracted a throat infection that eventually led to her total disability. So here we see uh, in her scrapbook, uh, Kurt Paul uh, from Indiana recovering from meningitis. First patient I cared for at that camp with meningitis. And uh, also in her scrapbook, patients convalescing from meningitis. So they're sleeping on the porch, getting some fresh air in wheelchairs. Uh, I've got a little puppy there. So after she moved, she, she would eventually move on from uh, Texas and she uh, served at Debarkation Hospital Number 5 in New York City and Embarkation Hospital Number 1 in Hoboken. These hospitals were for um, uh, uh, 
embarking for leave for soldiers on their way to France and soldiers on their on their way coming back from France. Uh, so all of the soldiers from that were training in what Iowa and Texas and Washington were putting them on trains and were and they're most of them are leaving from New York City and uh, sometimes they're sick uh, but but you know <laughs> sometimes they get off those uh, those trains during an influ influenza pandemic and they're sick so they, they need a hospital or sometimes uh, they're they're coming back home from being wounded in the war sometimes towards the end of the war that the a thousand soldiers a day might be coming through on these boats and they're coming home wounded or they're coming home out, out of those cramped uh, uh, hospital uh, on those cramped ships they're coming home uh, having caught influenza or meningitis or something else so uh, this is so they, they so here's a postcard that Sydney sent home from uh, to from New York City for the of a postcard of her ward in uh, debarkation hospital number five uh, she sent it back to her cousins in uh, in Minnesota on and dated uh, May 4th, 1919, so about six months, five, six months after the war ended, uh, she's still caring for soldiers. And a month after this uh, postcard was sent, she herself got sick. She, she, being a nurse is a dangerous job. And so she, that led to Signe having a, a permanent heart condition, this illness that she contracted during the war. Uh, and uh, she had this heart condition for the rest of her life. Uh, and uh, although it didn't, didn't prevent her from uh, living a long life, she died, uh, I think, age 91 in the 1970s. So let's go overseas now. Let's go over there to the front lines, to France. Before I talk more about people's uh, personal uh, stories, let's talk about the system of hospitals that uh, got wounded soldiers the care that they need in the right amount of time that they needed it. So it's all about triage. It's about uh, what modern hospitals today call triage. It's you're dealing with people who can be uh, ranging everywhere from just a scratch and need a need a bandage, or people who are really seriously injured uh, or seriously wounded. Uh, so we have the front line trenches, and then about 50 yards back from the front line trenches, we have aid stations. Um, so they're probably, this is still very much within a very a dangerous place. There's artillery shells, artillery shells exploding all around you. Uh, they're probably in bunkers themselves, like underground bunkers or in, in, in the trenches. About a mile and a half back from the front lines, you have dressing stations where you can get uh, a bit better uh, uh, service, for better, uh, better care. Uh, two to four miles back from the front lines, you have field hospitals. Here you get you can get you know surgeons and things like that. Uh, very important. Um, five to ten miles behind the front lines, you have evacuation hospitals. Uh, they are for what they say they're for. They're on the railroad lines. They're they're uh, you know they're they're still within range of artillery, but they're not very probably not very accurate artillery. Um, so it's still a dangerous place to be, but if if you, they're for stabilizing patients and getting them on railroad cars to get out of danger, to get to the base hospitals. And base hospitals are all around France, um, or you know, the, 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 or Italy or England, depending on where you are, uh, Belgium. Um, and this is where you get your good care. This is where uh, most of the nurses who are working uh, are. Um, so there are rules that uh, prevent women nurses from uh, serving too close to the front line. Uh, so most most of the nurses during World War One were were women, and uh, so they they were not allowed to be in aid aid stations or dressing stations, or I don't think they're supposed to be in field hospitals either. But these rules were routinely broken by the nurses themselves who wanted to be where they were needed, and they were broken by the uh, male doctors and surgeons and who needed the help of the nurses. Uh, so your first line of uh, yeah. Defense when when you get wounded is you. I guess all the soldiers had themselves had um, bandages, and so if you were wounded, then you have a friend bandage you up, or if they're not able to, you get a you bandage yourself up best you can. Um, 
and then you had litter bearers too. We call them stretchers or stretcher bearers now. Back in World War One, we tended to call them litters, uh, stretchers, litters, and litter bearers were the people hold, uh, carrying, who, whose job it was to carry soldier, wounded soldiers back uh, from the front line to the rear area, uh, where uh, they would be, you know, taken by ambulance to uh, the hospitals farther back. Uh, so if we're about to start an offensive the next day. The ambulances will say, okay, we'll, we'll tell the litter bearers, all right, we're going to meet here. Uh, this is where we're going to rendezvous. Just drop them here, and then we'll go back and forth and back and forth, uh, picking up wounded soldiers, bringing them back to the hospital. Return from wounded soldiers, bring them back to the hospital. Uh, uh, the ambulances were either horse-drawn or motorized uh, in World War One. Um, litter bearers uh, were often uh, the regimental band. So typically out of a, I think as a rule, out of a, a hundred guys, two of them would be designated as litter bearers. Often it was a reg regimental band. So like when you're, when the, the battle starts, just put down the trumpet and make yourself useful. Clarence Messer was an example of an ambulance driver from Moorhead. He was he grew up in Moorhead, went to the Moorhead Normal School, uh, which is a Minnesota State University Moorhead today, uh, and uh, he was an ambulance driver in France. Uh, the next back where well where the the ambulance is taken people dressing stations and field hospitals. So these are. A mile and a half, two miles, four miles back, um, and they are still very much in harm's way. Uh, you can see this dressing station is, or field hospital is in a bombed out old church where they're treating wounded soldiers on the floor. Uh, they're trying to stabilize their, their condition so that they can move them to safer places farther back, but they, this is where you, you got to stabilize the patient first. Um, John Tweeton of, uh, was, of Moorhead was in the 162nd Field Hospital in France. Where was the 162nd Field Hospital? It was all over the place. It was, it, it moved. Um, it, you think of these field, these hospitals are not buildings. These hospitals are, are groups of people. Um, and uh, if one day it might be in a like a bombed out church like this, the next day if the if the front line moved, they might move to be closer to the front line, and they might set up in tents. Here we see a photograph from the. A lot of these uh, photographs that I'm using come from either the National Archives or um, Library of Congress. Uh, here's a photograph of American soldiers being uh, loaded onto ambulances to be taken to farther farther back uh, evacuation hospitals uh, women would be serving in evacuation hospitals these are maybe like I said like four you know a, a ten miles dozen miles behind the line uh, and uh, they are there to uh, on railroad lines and they're designed to stabilize the patients for their trip to the base hospitals further back um, as an example of a local person, Leonard Favig from Moorhead was a surgery attendant during World War I in France. Uh, I don't know much about his service, but he certainly could have been at an evacuation hospital or field hospital or a base hospital. Um, here we see a photograph of uh, uh, nurses unloading wounded soldiers from an ambulance into a hospital. You can see that this hospital uh, judging by the windows there, it's probably a converted church. A lot of churches or uh, convents uh, or uh, mansions, chateaus, it would were converted into hospitals during the war. Base hospitals is where you get your best care. These are safe. These are big, um, off, often large buildings, but uh, also they are overcrowded, so they got a you can see here this this photograph it's in a tent uh, so overcrowded they, they can't all fit in the building so they set up tents and you can see here in the caption a cigarette is the first thing given to a soldier as soon as his wounds are attended to just like in uh, just like at hospitals today most women nurses were working in base hospitals just for this 
probably for the simple fact that th th these are the biggest hospitals uh, and they are safe. Um, this is where soldiers recuperate uh, and they could spend considerable time here. Gas um, was a terror weapon of World War One chemical warfare. Uh, so it was a terror weapon, but it wasn't partic It wasn't one of the great, the big killers of the war. It was used a lot, but only three percent of combat deaths in this war were from gas. Uh, and uh, but it, compared to like seventy percent of of deaths in this war were from artillery fire. But gas, it was terrifying. You you didn't you don't want to die of gas. Uh, the uh, the 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 gasping for air, the meant that they felt like they were drowning on land. Uh, so, and sometimes uh, they were blinded uh, and skin irritation. So these, there were separate wards for um, the particular care that gas victims would have in, in these hospitals. Uh, Americans had convalescent hospitals. See, the the French and the English, they didn't, really, and the Germans and the Austrians, they didn't, and the Russians, they didn't have convalescent hospitals. Uh, but Americans did for the simple fact that, uh, well, I mean, sometimes you get, sometimes a, a soldier gets wounded and they just need to recuperate for about a month and then they can be back in line and fighting again. And if you're, and if you're a soldier from England or France or Germany or Russia or Italy, uh, the army, after after they stabilize your condition, the army just sends you back home to mom or your wife to nurse you back to health and say, come back when you're ready. Um, they don't do that for Americans because it takes about two weeks to cross the Atlantic. And so if you're going to be off the line for a month, they're not going to send you back and put you on a boat and send you home on a two week voyage and then send you to the middle of the continent of recuperate with in Minnesota because by the time you get there it's time to go back get on another two-week boat ride and come back it's it's a waste of time so uh, for Americans and I you know I'm gonna assume Canadians too uh, would have had something would have had the similar situation uh, we had convalescent hospitals uh, Conrad Urine uh, of Moorhead was worked at base hospital 93 uh, in France, uh, which was a convalescent hospital, and uh, base hospital 93 was also known as uh, the Hotel Pavilion in Cannes, France. And so it's on the French Riviera. Uh, our France, our, our good friends, the French, were so appreciative that American soldiers were willing to uh, risk their lives for uh, to save France in their darkest hour that France obligingly uh, uh, converted some of their finest hotels to be convalescent uh, hotels uh, for American soldiers. Uh, and, and then, okay, so now you go back across the ocean, back home in the USA, we got embarkation hospitals and debarkation hospitals. So they're kind of the same thing, as far as I know. Um, they, and this is for soldiers who are returning, and they just need a little bit more care. Uh, they're not ready to go home quite yet. Like, apparently this guy here has, doesn't know how to dance yet. So... <laughs> uh, uh, a lot of soldiers returning home were suffering from shell shock, um, what today we call post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Um, and uh, we did care, um, uh, our government did care all this uh, about this. And so uh, they, they would get extra help at the embarkation hospitals. And uh, one of the, these soldiers here are doing things that take Oh, manual dexterity, simple ta repetitive tasks that are designed to occupy their mind and their uh, and getting their mind off of things. Uh, into chair caning and and the like right now is what they're doing. Okay, so let's talk about another nurse. The next nurse, Rose Clark. Rose Clark was born in Barnesville in Clay County. Uh, grew up there, but uh, uh, also but moved to Moorhead by the time that this uh, uh, that the war had started. She was a 28-year-old assistant superintendent of St. John's Hospital in Fargo. 
uh, this uh, this is what the building looked like oh maybe two years ago at, at the time of my recording this building has just been demolished uh, but she would have walked the halls here uh, right on the uh, on the bank of the Red River and when Rose Clark uh, volunteered uh, when the war started she volunteered for the Red Cross the Red Cross was the most important uh, non-military organization of World War I. Uh, the Red Cross, well, it's still an important organization today, but especially during World War I, it was incredibly important. Um, it, you know, I, I bet you all my baseball cards that your, your, the, the women of your family were volunteering for the Red Cross during World War I. Uh, the Red Cross raised money to stock hospitals hospitals uh they they built hospitals over there they stocked hospitals with all, all the supplies that they needed all the bandages um all the sweaters all the nurses they, uh, they stocked hospitals with nurses um and uh also they organized women on the home front to knit stuff like crazy like uh, the the u.s army i mean we had four million American servicemen going overseas, so we needed four million sweaters, and the U.S. Army didn't have a sweater factory, uh, so it was the the guys wearing sweaters uh, over there, or those sweaters were knit by their moms and their sisters and their girlfriends, and the women of America, uh, and and so that very important, and and the, the the women were also knitting a so many bandages that it, it just makes you want to cry. Uh, it just, it, it was, uh, we needed a horrific amount of bandages and they're, they're knitting them at, on the home front. So uh, Rose Clark, she volunteered with the Red Cross and she said that uh, she's willing to serve overseas. So they sent her. Her first impressions of France, uh, so she said, there are many different kinds of soldiers here, United States, English, Canadians, Australians, and it is a rather, and it is rather a pretty sight, but the French look much more shabby than the rest. So many of them have legs and arms off, are lame and others deformed. Well, I could almost cry. Two French soldiers passed us yesterday and they up and said, God bless you nurses. Uh, so in June of 1918, she and seven other nurses were sent to establish a field hospital behind the 3rd Infantry Division at a place called Chateau Thierry. Uh, and it took them three days of, of, of driving to find the headquarters and they were being shelled by, they were close enough to the front line that they're being shelled by artillery fire. And uh, they're, they're, when they're, they finally find the headquarters, uh, an angry officer comes running out at them saying, what the heck are women doing this close to the front lines? And it's this guy here, General John J. Pershing. This is, he is the <laughs> most powerful American in France, one of the highest ranking generals in American history, up right up there with George Washington and Ulysses Grant. Uh, and so he sees that the seven nurses, including Rose, and, and, uh, they have a picnic together before they go off and they establish this uh, this field hospital for the third division. So the, this is the the hospital that they established. It's called Joy sur Morin. I apologize for my French pronunciation uh, throughout this presentation. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, the American Red Cross. So this was an American Red Cross hospital. And Rose Clark was the night supervisor of nurses. So it, what it was, it was a big French um, uh, chateau in the countryside. Um, and it also a series of tents outside. It had 800 beds and there were 36 nurses for those beds. It was 30 miles from the front line, uh, which uh, was about a 45 minute ambulance ride. So Rose being the night supervisor of nurses, that was a very important position in what turned out to be a very important hospital because uh, within days or weeks, uh, you know, with, you know it, it, they, they set this place up in June of 19, 1918. Uh, in July, July 15, 1918, 
Chateau Thierry becomes the the epicenter of the war. Uh, you can see here in this this uh, artwork here, it says that Chateau Thierry was the turning point of the war, the Gettysburg of the war. Uh, it yeah it, it so what was happening was in the spring of of 1918 the german the america was just the, the usa was just starting to gear up and and get our soldiers overseas uh thousands were coming a day and the germans but by in the spring of 1918 we and in, in early summer of 1918 we did not have many soldiers over there yet so the germans knew that um more so once the americans come in force they're going to lose the war um we just have too many soldiers they're going to lose the war their only hope is to win the war before the americans show up and so they they launched a series of all or nothing offensives uh in not in the spring and summer of 1918 where they're either going to win the war in 19 in the summer of 1918 or they're going to lose the war and uh, it looked like they were going to win uh they all across the line french and and uh, uh english uh, armies were being driven back um and on july 15th they had just it seems like the, the germans had just enough strength to try it one more time and they focused their efforts on a town called chateau thierry that had two bridges over the marne river if they can take chateau thierry and cross the marne there's not much between them and paris and they attacked and they attacked and remember the Chateau Thierry this is they're attacking the third division at Chateau Thierry the American third division and this and the Rose Clark the, the, she is the hospital for this and they attack and the third division doesn't budge there the American third division is still called the rock of the Marne because they would not be budged <clears throat> that uh, and that battle starts with with <laughs> an international incident a war crime uh on that night july 15 1918 they bomb rose's hospital the germans bomb rose's hospital uh and it, they they drop bombs on the uh chateau itself uh, and rain that rained glass all on on the soldiers in in the house and they also drop bomb the, this photograph here this is a, one of the tents outside uh, you, all those little pinpricks of light, it looks like it's polka dotted. Those are pinpricks of light that are holes in the tent. Uh, so you, that are caused by shrapnel from the bombs exploding. 12 men were killed uh, at this hospital. One nurse was permanently paralyzed. So I'm going to read you um, a letter home that she wrote, that Rose Clark wrote to her parents and that was published in the Barnesville Record Review newspaper. She said, Dearest folks, just a minute to tell you I am well and feel fine, but working hard. Everyone is, but you will know by this time what we have done at blank. That was uh, cut out by the censors, the, her location, the secret. Our latest report comes to us that the line has moved up nearly 10 miles and our boys who are coming in say the Germans are still running. See, once the Germans attacked and once the once the once their attack failed, we launched a counterattack. Uh, the Americans, the the British and the English, uh, launched a counterattack all along the line, and uh, the tide of the war had turned. The the Germans were running, so they're about to move. There are field hospitals, so they better move their hospital up closer. Rose continues. Just tell the women at home not to throw down the job of making dressings. If you could see that, that's bandages. If you could see how many we use here, we try to be as saving as possible, but one man sometimes has as many as eight or nine wounds. Just glance at the Barnesville record and they want to have more people work at them. So please send this message for me. The Red Cross means so much and the boys almost cry when they know what is being done for them. So many have said to me, oh, what we would have done without you and what the people at home do. I have many things to tell you, but don't worry if I don't write. Heard today we might move up uh, toward the line, too, uh, as we are getting farther away from it. Please excuse pencil as I, only, as I have only four hours to sleep and have to go into the operating room. I am all over the place, sometimes in the tents and then the operating room to give the ether. 
I'll, I should mention that in the photographs I'm showing in the background, this is her hospital at the time she, uh, of, the, of, of this offensive during the summer of, uh, of, 1980, of 1918. Uh, and one day I went to the next village to put some of our wounded on the hospital train to be sent back to the base. The trains are wonderful things. Lights, fans, running water, and everything. I will know what to do when I get back to a place where I can have things, things up to date. Here's a photograph of a hospital train. The thing she's mentioning, lights, fans, running water. This is, a, this is over 100 years ago. Um, for farms in Clay County, a lot of them didn't get plumbing and electricity uh, until the 1940s. So these trains were kind of marvels. And she ends with, please excuse pencil again, as I cannot find my pen, and also this awful looking letter. Much love, Rose Clark. So after this offensive, Rose Clark would continue to uh, serve in hospitals, uh, supporting the San Mihal offensive and the Meuse Argonne offensive for the, for the rest of the war. So this is all pretty dramatic stuff. Dramatic, in fact, that they made a play about it. Uh, one of the uh, uh, men that male nurses or order or corpsmen that she was working with at that hospital, his name was Walter Charles Roberts, and he becomes a theater professor in New York State after the war, and in using, uh, and, and he dramatizes this time period in a play called Red Harvest, uh, and it, it was. This is a photograph of one of the performances uh, in the 1933 is when he, is when it was uh, is when he wrote the play uh, and the the character the the night nurse Rose Clarkson was certainly based on night nurse Rose Clark. Now right, let's talk about a th another uh, the experience of another nurse uh, Hilma Freeberg. Hilma Freeberg is from Moorhead. Uh, age 24, she was working as a nurse when the war began. Uh, her dad, uh, her, she's Swedish, well, her, her, her parents are Swedish, um, like a, a lot of Scandinavians living in, in uh, Clay County during this time period. Uh, her dad ran a grocery store, but he had died by the, uh, by the time the war started. Um, nine, May 22, 1918, this ran in the Moorhead Daily News. Miss Hilma Freeberg left last night for Camp Dodge, that's in Iowa, to assume the duties of a Red Cross nurse. Actually, I think that might be a, a misprint. She was a, a Army, Army Nurse Corps, not Red Cross. Miss Freeberg is the daughter of Mrs. A.G. Freeberg of 10th Street South and has several years experience as a practical trained nurse. She is a Moorhead bred young lady of high ideals and accomplishments, and her many friends in Moorhead and Fargo will be pleased to learn of the choice she has made in serving the nation where she can do so much good. Here is the ship list uh, where she went overseas on the uh, Aquitania is the name of the ship, September 2, 1918, leaving New York. She is part of Base Hospital Number 53. Um, Ba again, so d again, don't think about hospitals as buildings in World War One. Think of them as a collection of doctors and nurses and support staff who move from one place to the next. Base Hospital Number 53 formed in the USA and it moved to France. It had started off with 99 nurses and one dietitian. Hilma was one of the nurses. They set up base hospital number 53 outside of a town called Langre, France, which is 120 miles from the front line, so it's safely out of harm's way. Uh, this photograph was taken from town looking out into uh, onto the hospital complex. Uh, so although there's a whole lot of tents and buildings over there at base hospital 53. And then they were uh, joined by another 95 nurses when they were in France, including another nurse with Clay County Connections. Margaret McGregor grew up in Hawley. She's age 43 years old when the war begins. Uh, and she, uh, when the war started, she was a nurse working in St. Paul. So Margaret, we, we got two Clay County nurses at Base Hospital 53. 
Uh, here's a photo of the some of the nurses of Hospital 53. In total, there are about 200 nurses, plus surgeons, plus corpsmen, and officers uh, at Base Hospital 53. Uh, and uh, yeah, they needed soldiers too because they weren't just uh, they weren't just nursing back to health the um, American and French and, and, uh, and, and British soldiers. If uh, German or Austrian soldiers were injured, they would nurse them back to health as well. So those guys need to be guarded. One of the people working at Base Hospital 1553 was uh, PFC Bill Shearer. He was a nurse. Um, and uh, here's the picture of Bill on the, on the left. And uh, he's not from Clay County, but what the reason I'm including him is because he left a diary. He wrote a diary, and it's online. Uh, and so I'm going to read some passages from the diary because while his job would be a little bit different than uh, than Hil uh, than Hilma and uh, and Margaret, um, they he was at the same place, seeing the same things. In fact, he even mentions them uh, from time to time. Uh, well, men men mentions Hilma. Uh, uh, like on January 25, 1918, he says, have Miss Helen Freeberg for a nurse and don't like her. <laughs> he even got her name wrong. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, they did um, they did become good, you know, uh, co-workers. And, and after a few months, he does a... Uh, uh, like it, they, they do like each other they become friends uh he act after he's he gets sick in the spring of 1919 and so his friend hilma was uh well, Hil freeberg sent me a carton of camel cigarettes and on april 20th miss freeberg sent me a nice big bouquet of pansies so they're friends they become friends um so i'll, I'll just read some of the uh, some of the passages from from bill's um, uh, diary. He says, I worked uh, September 16, 1918. Uh, I worked all, all day yesterday and all night. We are all ready for the train load of patients. At 4 a.m., train just arrived at station uptown. My duty is to unload ambulances and trucks. 10 a.m., we just unloaded the last patient. So that's six hours later. We have over 400 in this convoy. I am all in. I have been working for about 30 hours. Everything went fine, and the convoy of patients are all in bed. 1.30 p.m. I am piling wood. I wish I could get some sleep. September 18. Uh, so just a few days later. Just received orders that another a convoy of patients will arrive at 5 p.m. That means work like hell again all night. I believe I have the grip. That's like the flu. I ache all over and have a high fever and a bad cold in my lungs. I got wet again last night on guard. Two of our patients died the first night they were here. Convoy arrived at 6 p.m. Over 300 patients, 18 German prisoners. I am, gar I am guard over the prisoners. I am using a 45 automatic Colt. I would like to open up with it. They are all pretending to sleep. October 1, there were two convoys of patients came in last night. One was men that were gassed, the other was all surgical cases. Some men have their arms off, some their legs, and they are all badly shot up. They are all from the Verdun front. Another man died in this ward this morning from pneumonia. There are eight or nine in the morgue now. Pneumonia, that's um, when you get Spanish influenza, pneumonia is what is what ends up killing you. There, this October, the fall of 1918, this is the peak of the Spanish influenza pandemic. October 7, I have 45 patients and four delirious men. One of them pulled a knife on the nurse. I give him a shot in the arm every hour and have to overpower him. 7 p.m., I was just going off duty when one man died. Now I must fix him up and take him to the morgue. October 25, we have been warned to look out for an air raid. The lights are all out. I have a lantern in my ward office and have the window camouflaged with a blanket. Patient in number 37 is quite ill tonight. He is all shot up with shrapnel and I fear he is getting pneumonia. 
I hope not. It is hard work among 48 sick and wounded patients without a light. And I think, uh, <laughs> uh, it, you know, the, the war is over December 13th. The war has been over for a month, but they're still over there. People, so people are still, uh, uh, needing medical attention. Um, but, uh, it's, it's funny to, to read the diary behind the scenes. It gets a little bit general hospital or Gray's anatomy. This one's kind of funny. Uh, Bill says, I have the blues tonight. I wish I was out of here. My ward is like a nut house. Always a bunch of men sneaking around and coming in to spoon with the nurses. They make my ass tired with their love affairs. Several are trying to buzz around me, but I knock them all off. Miss Turner was in this morning. I think she is darling and she is buzzing around me, but I won't make up with her. It doesn't amount to a damn. If they do it with one, they will do it with all, and it cannot last anyway. But damn it, I like Miss Turner, but we'll stay out of her way. Coakley likes to make love to me when she gets a chance, but the old fart is nutty. Oh hell, what's the use? All right, so let's uh, talk about our last nurse, Elizabeth McGregor. Remember Margaret McGregor from Base Hospital 53? Margaret has a younger sister, uh, a year younger. Eh? She's age 42, so she is, therefore, she also grew up in Hawley, Minnesota, uh, and... Uh, at age, uh, in age 42, when the war starts, uh, she is a nurse working in St. Paul at a very important hospital, Dr. Arthur Gillette's Children's Hospital. Uh, here's a photograph of Gillette Children's Hospital. Um, so this was kind of a groundbreaking hospital, a uh, children's hospital in Minnesota. It still is. It's a good place. Um, and uh, when the war began, well, in the summer of 1914, Dr. Gillette sends Elizabeth McGregor uh, uh, to Belgium to study uh, the children's hospitals in Belgium to see if there's anything that we can learn from them. And while she is in Belgium, the Germans invaded. <laughs> the war begins. Uh, so, uh, so Elizabeth, she she volunteers to be a Red Cross nurse for a few months, where, uh, and she's tending wounded soldiers um, in. Well, for a few months before she decides that it's time to return home to America, and she she returns home, uh, and uh, until the the United States of America joins the war in April of 1917, and she decides that uh, it's her duty to go back. She should go back to France, go back over there, and help out. Uh, but she didn't join the Army Nurse Corps. She didn't join the Red Cross. She joined the American Fund for French Wounded. So what this is about is there is a woman in St. Paul named Mary Leslie Ames. And she starts a St. Paul chapter of the American Fund for French Wounded. This is like a, this is like a charity. Uh, Mary Leslie Ames is the wife of a wealthy publisher. She's very active in high society, really wants to do something good. So she raises $3,000, and that's $3,1918. That's a lot of money, enough to open up seven what they call dispensaries. Uh, we would probably call them clinics. Um, and uh, they, they're, they are to designed to help French civilians who are living near the front lines and who don't have adequate um, uh medical attention you know just because you're even if you're not in the war doesn't mean that you don't it more it's more than just the soldiers who need medical attention so mary leslie ames uh she hires nurse elizabeth mcgregor to run those seven dispensaries elizabeth gets um, uh, a leave of absence from gillette from dr gillette to go to return to france um and these um, seven dispensaries that McGregor's in charge of, uh, they are really near the front line. They're close enough so that the people who are living in these seven towns uh, are, uh, they, they, they're, they're not living at home. Their homes are being shelled by, by shell fire. It's not safe to live in their homes. Uh, some of them are sleeping in mines or uh, in caves. Uh, so yeah, they need medical attention. They are in the na in these towns. You know, pardon my French, but uh, 
Nueves Maison, Chaligny, Sientry, Juilly, Maron, Nancy, and Toul. Uh, and so the woman who raised, Mrs. Ames, who, who raised the money for the for these uh, uh, American Fund for French Wounded, she is um, important enough that when that her papers are in the collection of the Minnesota Historical Society. And among her papers are work reports that Elizabeth McGregor sends home to St. Paul, to Minnesota, so that, um, you know, so when you read them, some of them sound like they're like just just letting you know we're doing our job over here but also i think that there's there's enough personal cases in here that elizabeth mcgregor is using these or, or she's providing uh mrs ames uh with uh stories that she can tell people to raise more money to keep funding these hospitals so uh these are the words of elizabeth mcgregor that i'm reading here we have from 75 to 115 patients a day at the dispensaries. They're located in at Nueves Maison, Chaligne, Maron, Cientry, Juilly, and Nancy. We open up at 9 a.m. and work until we have cared for everyone who comes before 11, which has meant 2.30 so far. Then we grab our lunch and chase to the next and treat everyone who comes in before 5 and come home when we get through. We have been having dinner from 8.30 to 9 p.m. To date, people from 20 towns have come. One woman with six children walked 12 kilos, the youngest child six weeks old. So she had just gave birth six weeks ago and walked 12, mi 12 uh, kilometers. Uh, and she had to walk back. They have had no care since the beginning of the war, and living conditions are not such as would be conducive to robust health. Sleeping underground in cellars, not having proper food, with extra hard work and the constant tension they are living under make them need all the care we can give them. Uh, have I ever told you about any of the cases we have? Children who have been prisoners in Germany those suffering from shell shock, some who have been injured in bombardments and, and raids, besides the numbers that have improper living conditions, insufficient food, and hard, heavy work due to the present situation. Without counting Nancy, we now have people coming to our clinic from 25 villages. I want to tell you about a few of our cases. A little girl came to the clinic about a month ago. I sent for an older sister, age 14, who is the head of the household. There are five children, two girls and a boy in one family, two girls in the other, cousins. One girl, 14, and a girl, 13, earned the living. Both fathers were killed in the war. One mother died recently and one died years ago. The youngest child is five. They have a garden and the little ones go to school. They are not having enough to eat and two have a cough. Since our visits to the home, they are getting milk, butter, and eggs. We have the promise of some clothing, and we hope to brighten the lives of the two little workers in other ways. The living conditions are so difficult that it is a wonder that they are well at all. And this one, November 17, so this is the week, this was sent the week after the war ends, after we win the war. She said, last month I made 166 house visits and saw 900 in the dispensaries. We were without a doctor and had much grip and pneumonia. We have a doctor now. The past week has been a wonderful experience. Tuesday morning at 8 o'clock, the procession of beds started down our hill, 20 kilometers of them. So people are returning home with their beds. Children who had never slept at home since the war stayed, uh, since the war stayed at home that night. Babies have been sleeping in the mines since they were born. As late as last Sunday, we had six raids in one, in one day, and to think it is all over, and our abri are being pulled down and used to make roads. Abri is uh, boards that you put over your uh, windows uh, to, uh, uh, so that uh, if, the, if your window breaks, it doesn't shatter into your house. They're being pulled down to make roads. So, 
we win the war. Hooray. After the, let's go, what happened after war? So after the war, uh, Signe Lee becomes a nurse for Moorhead Public Schools and lives in my house, which is right across the street from the high school at the time. Uh, Rose Clark, uh, she, uh, she took a Red Cross nursing job in California and she married a shoe salesman and she raised a family. Uh, Hilma Freeberg married an army officer and as army, off, uh, army families do, uh, she moved all around the country. Uh, she lived in Hawaii for a while, came back to Minnesota. Uh, and Margaret McGregor, or uh, I'm sorry, I said, uh, I wrote Margaret McGregor. That should be Elizabeth McGregor there. Elizabeth McGregor becomes the superintendent of Gillette Children's Hospital in St. Paul. And uh, she is even remembered on her on their website. Nine, this is uh, from Gillette Ch Children's Hospital. Uh, 1921, Elizabeth McGregor, the hospital superintendent, creates a postgraduate course for nurses. Her sister, Margaret McGregor, supervises the nurses. You remember Margaret from uh, Base Hospital 53. Uh, and in 1930, Elizabeth McGregor is quoted as saying, I know of no one who has had the privileges that I have had, who has loved life and people more, and has had a better time doing the tasks that come by day by day. Uh, and when she retired, it, uh, it was estimated that she had helped 20,000 children during her career. Um, and uh, so that's all I'm going to talk about today, except I'm just going to leave this last slide saying that um, I didn't even talk about the nurses who were serving at home in during the influenza pandemic. Here's a, a scrapbook of Cora Alberg, who was a nurse in Moorhead at Northwestern Hospital, just uh, showing candid photographs of the nurses who um, helped uh, served their own communities and helped uh, our community get through the uh, influenza pandemic and just the everyday things we need nurses for at, at home. Um, Cora Alberg, the woman who uh, took these wonderful photographs that are in our Historical Society's collection, uh, the, she would herself die of a disease um, in, in uh, the early 1920s, a disease that she caught while at work. Uh, thank you and thanks to all of our nurses.